Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. As protests have spread throughout the region and the nation, some demonstrators are taking their kids. Our producer, Laura Hamden, recently spoke with one such man at a daytime protest in St. Charles. He was there with his 18-month-old daughter. My name is Adam Walker. I am uh, an architect and construction project manager, and I'm also a minister. And I've experienced um, police brutality and systematic racism um, throughout my life and overcame it. And I just want to make sure that in this time, in this age, that my voice is heard. Is this um, your daughter? Yeah, this is my daughter, Sydneyana. And I wanted to make sure that when, when history told this story, um, that she would be able to say that she was a part of the resistance, that she was a part of the people who let their voice be heard, that she didn't just sit back, that it wasn't just me that stood up, but she took a stand as well. And that was Adam Walker in St. Charles. And I think we could there here at the very end, Sydneyana making her voice heard. So what can your kids learn from attending a protest? And how can parents navigate the minefield that is a conversation about race with young children? My two guests today are both board members of We Stories. That's a local nonprofit organization that aims to help parents do just that. And the first guest is Pamela Washington. In addition to her work with We Stories, she is also the district gifted coordinator for the Webster Grove School District, and she is herself the mother of two. So Pam, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sarah, Thank and, you for having me. And we're also joined today by Jenna Voss. She's an assistant professor and director of deaf education at Fontbonne University, and she also is a mother of three. So Jenna, welcome. Hi, thanks for having us. So Pam, I want to start with you. You first took your children to a march in 2017. What what led you to do that? Um, um, so after the Stokely verdict, which was announced um, like September, it was a Friday because I remember uh, it was the scheduled balloon glow that takes place in and it was canceled. Mm -hmm. And um, some friends and I decided we wanted to to participate in the protest. And during the protest in the Central West End, we were um, approached by um, police in riot gear, tear gas, forced to take shelter Ugh. in Central Reform Congregation. And so after that incident, um, I knew that not only was it imperative for my children to have a voice, but them for for them to understand their constitutional right to assemble and understand that they are the future. And so um, there were some protests during the day organized by Expect Us, and um, those were the protests that they participated in. And, and Pam, um, that was that was really um, interesting to hear about what was happening back in 2017. Um, we're having some trouble with your phone line. We're going to um, call you right back, hopefully get a cleaner version, and I'll talk to Jenna here for just a moment. So we'll bring you back into this conversation shortly. And for our listeners, um, as a reminder to them, she's talking about the Stockley verdict. That was a St. Louis um, City police officer who was charged with murder. And when he was found not guilty of that by a judge, um, the city erupted, and some of those protests got pretty heated, as, as Pam there just explained. Jenna, uh, turning to you, I know you trace your political awakening to the death of Michael Brown, and that was in 2014. How was that a wake-up call for you? Yeah, um, I really distinctly remember um, sitting on the couch with my husband, watching Reddit and the news and any media we could consume, and noticing in that moment, but I have words for it now and I didn't then, but that was when I really um, became much more aware of my white privilege. And so my partner and I um, really began talking then about what it would look like to um, be on an active anti-racist parenting trajectory, right? How do we, how would we um, raise our children in a way that wouldn't have to have them be awakened in their 30s to um, the fact that they are white and that with being white come unearned privileges in our society. So that's when I attribute my own sort of wake up call to um, a, an anti-racist journey. I think that um, at the time I did not have 
knowledge or confidence or thoughts about um, taking my children to protests, and I even had a lot to unpack about my own participation. So really, um, I didn't start taking my children until this year um, and the death of George Floyd when um, more opportunities for taking to the streets came came up again. Mm. Um, now, now, Pam, I understand you're back with us. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Oh, and now I can hear you much better. Um, Jenna was just sort of describing her political awakening going back to 2014. And I understand for you, um, it didn't have to take the death of Michael Brown for you to be aware of this. This was something that you had been living your whole life. Is that right? Um, Yes. So my parents were very... um, they wanted to. Ma- they wanted me to make sure that I had a clear understanding of my history, as well as some of the challenges and the triumphs. And so, I think my parents were very intentional on giving me a history, and I wanted to pass that on to my children. And so, this was nothing new. It was just a matter of me, as a parent, making sure that my children understood that their voice matters, and also for them to be involved in, um, you know, the community and to say and be brave enough to say when something is wrong. Do you think in many cases black parents are are more comfortable talking about race because they have to talk about race in the way that so many white parents feel like they can just avoid it? Um, I think it is something that we as parents also have to grapple with. Um, I think some black parents are more comfortable than others. It really depends Mm -hmm. on um, maybe their upbringing and some of the experience they had. Um, so I can't necessarily speak for all black parents, but I can say at least for my circle of friends and my family, we have very um, explicit conversations with our children um, in our own households as well as in groups when they are collectively together. Mm-hmm. Jenna, do you get the sense from your friends that that's something that, that um, most white families are trying to deal with or, or are they are some just avoiding it? Um, I would say in in the regular circles of parenting talk, I, until more recently, I haven't noticed uh, race and uh, racial identity and then privilege and bias being in power, (laughs) being part of those conversations of the white families that I socialized with. I think there's a shift. I think there's a movement happening Um, And I think that more people are coming to, more white parents are coming to know that this is our responsibility. And and I think that our, my own, I'll speak in my I voice, my own trepidation and fear about how to have these conversations has really just gone away once I've started doing this and making it a habit, right? So um, I don't need to be afraid of having these conversations with my peers and with my partner and with my family. We just need to get in the practice of doing it so it's normalized and isn't a taboo topic. Mm -hmm. So tell me, how has We Stories helped with that for you? Uh, Phenomenally, in fact. (laughs) So We Stories was the catalyst that um, gave me a community of other predominantly white parents who were also bumbling through with me. And I needed to unpack some of my own perfectionist tendencies. But um, once I've sort of started on this journey of internal work that also needs to result in action, it's been really helpful to have a community of other parents dappling in that too. There are models of um, other white parents in the group who've been further along on their anti-racism journey than I have. And um, it has also been powerful to come back to the group and uh, use use it in part for holding me accountable to what I'm learning about to put into practice and also just to feel supported like we might go to a different community for how to do toilet learning and how to, uh, you know, do diapering. We, we turn to parent communities for a lot of things and I, I feel like the We Stories has been the right community for me to think about anti-racist parenting. 
Uh, we're talking to Jenna Voss. She's an assistant professor and director of deaf education at Fompon University, and we're discussing the idea of talking to kids about race, taking kids to protest, dealing with everything that, that right now is so front and center in the American conversation. And our other guest today is Pamela Washington. She also works with We Stories, and she's the district gifted coordinator for the Webster Grove School District. Um, Pam, I'm, I'm curious for you, what led you to get involved with We Stories? Um, a friend... Uh, told me about We Stories when we were taking a walk, and she um, knows that I have a passion for um, having conversations and teaching about race and equity. And so she shared that after participating in the pilot program, that this would be something that um, I would be interested in. And so it actually was maybe a couple of months after that that I met both co-founders, Adelaide Lancaster and Laura Horowitz, and we were able to um, talk about the need to have anti-bias, anti-racist conversations, primarily with white families, and using literacy as, as the tool. And um, I was so intrigued by the fact that books were um, the main focus of the conversation hmm. that I pretty much said, you know, um, I'm on board. I support you. Anything that you need, I'd be happy to advise. And so I felt like this was something that was very different, very unique, but yet in a simple way, a safe way for white families to read a book and then have discussions about race, racism, and then characters of color um, and a protagonist light. Um, and so I know we have conversations with our kids about how to use the bathroom. You know, there's the book, Everybody Poops. And so what better way to um, change the narrative and change the comfort level um, than to use a book to have conversations, healthy conversations about race and racism. Hmm. Now, we um, heard from some of our listeners through social media. Um, William writes, we bring our 12-year-old daughter to protests. She insisted she is taking ownership of her future and crafting the world she wants, one where people have bodily autonomy, equal opportunity, and are valued for who they are, regardless of gender, race, sexual preference, or religion. So that's a 12-year-old there. That's great to hear. Um, Nicolette writes on Facebook, I have a young child, not quite two and a half. How can I talk with him about race in a way he can understand? I'm sure it is important to start the conversation young and keep it going, but I struggle with where to start. Um, Jenna, I know you have a nine-year-old and five-year-old twins, and, and Pam, you have two daughters. They're 13 and 10. What are your thoughts on how early parents should be starting with this? Um, Pam, thoughts on that? So I would say that um, we... My husband and I um, had our girls active in, um, I believe it was the Democratic debate that took place at Washington University in 2016 or around that time. Um, and we started taking them to uh, public events just so they could have like a lens of what it's like to assemble and to stand up for something. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, since they were like, very, very young, like maybe toddlers. Um, we were very intentional about some of the books that we selected and we read to them. Um, one of the books in particular, Let the Children March um, by Monica Clark Robinson is a book about the children's crusade that took place in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. Hmm. And, and um, you know, I think that books for us were a gateway to let our children know that there's a history of children being active participants. Um, and assembling and protesting, um, and that children's voice matters. Um, so that was just one of the ways that we kind of eased them into it. But I would have to say that they were hesitant because they feared um, the police. They were fearful that they would get in trouble. Um, and so having that conversation with them about not being fearful of riot police and that they would be protected and that mm. this is their right. And so um, we still have to, you know, have those conversations um, with them, even though they're older. Hmm. Jenna, what would be some tips that you'd want to suggest for parents who are trying to have this conversation for the first time? Sure. I think the um, beauty of parenting is that you don't have to get it right <laughs> the first time. There are 
seemingly endless and infinite opportunities to revisit things that were bumpy or hard or bumbly with, with your kids' conversations. So for me, um, you know, We Stories, the organization that helps people who aren't already having conversations about race and racism uh, nudge them in the right direction, we do start with children's books, like Pam has said, and that's a great way to practice the conversation. We also joke a bit in the We Stories um, organization about how we invite people in through these beautiful children's books. You think you're signing up in this family learning program to um, learn how to read these great books and start these conversations with your kids. And it's almost a bait and switch of it's actually about practicing how to um, lean into these conversations as adults, hmm. right? So it's not ever too soon to start. You think about parenting before you become a parent often, many of us do. And so I think this uh, goes part and parcel to that. I have found that um, starting with a book feels really safe. We're looking at a book, we're looking at beautiful pictures, we're talking about a story of someone else's words they've written for us. And it makes it easier to revisit again and again and again. Hmm. What about, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I also found that like for me and for my family, um, books also became like a safe place, but our crutch a little bit. And so I needed to um, nudge myself beyond the books to the actual action, right? Because while conversation is critically important, it's wholly insufficient. And so, um, for example, taking my kids to a protest is a way of making really visible to my children um, an act. And while it is also a small act, because just participating in a, a peace walk or a protest or a march is also insufficient it is really visible and tangible they hear the chants they see who's leading and who's on the megaphone and who isn't Um, and so that has been a nudge to get us um, making visible the internal work my husband and I are doing and naming the action that our family is um, taking. Hmm. And Pam, just in our last minute here, for those who ag- agree with all this and, and they feel strongly about this movement, but they're feeling a little timid about taking their kids to one of these marches, um, what would you want to say to them? I think it is, um, for my household and for my children, it's imperative for them to see that assembling and protesting is actually peaceful. And I think for my children, it affirms, especially for the recent marches and protests, it affirms that them as black children, black lives matter, and they need to hear that affirmation um, that they are valued and they need to um, see their peers and educators um, uh, say that and hear that. And I think that um, the protests are very peaceful and you have to be there to feel the positive energy and see that this is actually um, important for our children to participate in so they understand not only the constitutional right, but also that their voice matters. Um, And and, uh, unfortunately, we're out of time, but that's the perfect note to end on. So Pamela Washington, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And Jenna Voss, uh, thank you. Thank you. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. That's 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. St. Louis Public Radio's The Gateway gives you the day's news first thing every weekday morning. From the ever-evolving relationship between St. Louis City and County to developments in the Missouri and Illinois state capitals, and reports from our correspondents in Rolla and the Metro East. We put it all in a roughly 10-minute package with clarity and context. Download The Gateway wherever you get podcasts.